Hello, this is Alan Brooks, and today we're going to be talking about what is my theory about the end of time, and why is it so important? Hey, I'm not that great, I'm not even that smart, but I did see something after 30 years of research. I saw a pattern, a sequence of events. I guess it would be like if you looked at World War II, there's a pattern, and if you, every time you saw um, Hiroshima, you sneaked a peek back, and you saw that there was a definite sequence of events right behind Hiroshima, right? Like, what would be that sequence of events? Well, it would start with Pearl Harbor. It would last about three and a half years, and then uh, along the way there would be like uh, a battle of Midway and a battle of Okinawa. And then it would end with uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So, why are you saying this, Alan? What's the big deal? Well, I did something that I don't think many people do, which is look at the Old Testament. And I saw that this uh, Jesus Christ comes back in the Old Testament far more times than most of us have realized. I certainly was never taught that he came back even once. And I've heard fam famous teachers say, Jesus never comes back in the Old Testament. But as I researched the subject, I found that that's not even true. He comes back in Isaiah 5. He comes back all through the Old Testament, Joel 2. It's, how do we know this? Because of keywords. It's like, what happens when Jesus comes, comes back in Matthew 24? Well, the sun, moon, and stars are darkened, and then Jesus Christ comes back in the sky. Well, in the same way, the, the same event happens in the Old Testament. Jesus Christ, the banner, as he's nicknamed in the Old Testament, comes back often with the sun, moon, and stars being darkened, and often after the tribulation, or the great tribulation, which is the last three and a half years of time. And so I began to wonder, is there a secret pattern of events, a secret sequence of events all throughout the Old Testament, which would help collate, which would help us understand what exactly is going to happen? I guess, like I said, if you compare it to World War II, there's a pattern of events that's set in stone. It starts with Pearl Harbor for America, it lasts three and a half years, it has, uh, you know, Midway and then Okinawa, and it ends with Hiroshima. So no matter how much I studied, if let's say if we had a Bible about this war, uh, studied all the details, all the minutia, and tried to put together the jigsaw puzzle, no matter how much I studied, the, the set in stone sequence of events would always be that way. In the same way, the Bible is like that. No matter how much I study the Bible, the last three and a half years is always the same. It starts with an event, and it ends with the Bible's Hiroshima, which is Jesus Christ coming back with the sun, moon, and stars being darkened. You know, we've seen lately, this is uh, 2017, September, October, we've seen a lot of teachings about the blood moons and how, oh, Jesus Christ could come back. But the real Bible says there's one sequence of events— the people ask Paul, hey, Paul, did we miss the second coming? Did we miss the rapture? And he goes in Second Thessalonians, he goes, uh, no, people, you can't miss it unless you see a great apostasy and the Antichrist revealed. So has that happened yet? I don't think so. And what is he talking about by the Antichrist revealed? Well, uh, you know, this, there's one last seven years known as the tribulation in Christian circles. We've all been taught that, right? That's from Daniel 9.27. It says there that he, the Antichrist, makes an agreement for seven years. But in the middle, it's a peace treaty, folks. But in the middle of that last seven years, this Antichrist breaks the treaty. He floods into Jerusalem. He comes into a new temple that Israel is supposedly building secretly right now. He stops the sacrifices that Israel wants to start again. And then he proclaims himself the Messiah. The Mahdi, the Muslim Messiah, or perhaps he's associated with some kind of other dimensional being, which is who's going to claim to be the real gods. You know, a popular um, teaching among UFO lore is that the uh, the, the Muslim, I'm sorry, the aliens are our real gods, and so maybe they'll somehow combine those two to fool everybody into worshiping the Antichrist. Who knows? It should be interesting to see, huh? Anyway, so the interesting part is that Daniel spoke of this last seven years once and but it's everywhere in the christian circles but he spoke of this last three and a half years which is the antichrist invades israel breaks the peace in the middle of that last seven years and he rules the antichrist rules and tramples jerusalem for the last three and a half years now have you guys heard that 
I doubt it. Most of you have heard how the Antichrist is some Pope-like figure strolling through the streets of Jerusalem, and suddenly he throws a cloak over his head and he becomes the Antichrist, like, uh, you know, just some evil deed. But that's not what the Bible really says. The Bible really says that this Antichrist is the Assyrian, which is ancient Assyria, is located northeast of Israel. It says in Daniel 11, he's the king of the north. In Jeremiah, he is leads a northern army. Uh, all throughout in Jeremiah uh, 49, I believe, it's a king of the north. And Ezekiel, he's from the north. So what is north of Israel? Well, it's Muslim nations. It's, uh, you know, that's what's north of Israel. And that's why the Antichrist is going to be because the, the all of the Bible speaks of the Antichrist as being a certain way. He wants to invade Israel and destroy it. He wants to cut off heads and he wants he hates Christians. Well, you know, what does the Muslims do today? Uh, they want to invade Israel. They cut off heads and they hate Christians. Hmm. Now, maybe there could be another candidate like the Pope. But, you know, it seems to me that Islam is the Antichrist religion. If you look at this one place in the book of Revelation, it says uh, 666, which we all know is the number of the Antichrist or the beast. And it says that, but in, that's in Greek, in what it was originally written. But in Arabic, it it's actually spells out a name. There is no God but Allah. Spells out um, a phrase in Arabic. You know, what are the chances of that? Could God be sending us a message about the identity of the Antichrist? And get this, on the Dome of the Rock, a place in Israel, that's a Muslim shrine, the second most holiest shrine in the world, it says God has no son. Now, what is the definition of Antichrist? In the Bible... It's where people who deny that God has a son. So get a clue, people. It's not New York City. Uh, it's not some president. It's not the Vatican. It's not the Pope who's going to do all these things. Who will do it? It's Muslims, people. And, you know, I'm not saying hate Muslims. I'm just saying that's what the Bible predicts. It's four out of four. I mean, you know, it's hard. It's hard to say it's something else because it's obviously Islam. And so that's what we need to go with is Islam is going to lead a northern army to break this peace treaty. And another part, get this. I mean, who wants to make a treaty with Israel for peace? It's Muslims, people. So that's the true sequence of events the Bible has, that there's going to be a false peace, a fake peace, uh, you know, a bad peace agreement, as Isaiah 28 says. Or f false prophets say peace, peace, Jeremiah 4, Jeremiah 6 through 8. So you can see there is a sequence of events. And then this peace is broken by an invasion from the north by Antichrist armies. And so over and over and over, the Bible says the same sequence of events, like Pearl Harbor, then uh, Midway, and then uh, Okinawa, and lastly Pearl Harbor. Like that, the Bible has its own events. The Bible says this last time is not seven years because the first half of that seven years is a peace treaty. The Bible says the last three and a half years is the real great tribulation or the time of Jacob's trouble as Jeremiah 30 verse 7 says. Now why does it say that? Because over and over again there's a secret aspect of the end of time that almost everybody leaves out and nobody talks about. We and, and I understand why they don't talk about it. It's because we have been taught to love Israel, a supporter, and I completely love and 100% support Israel. But the Bible says something odd that most of us have not been taught. That at the end of time, for some reason, uh, God will be upset with his people and it will be he who brings the Antichrist as a punishment for his own people. Have you ever heard that? You know, I never had, but that's what I saw. Now, why? Why would he be upset with his own people? Well, several reasons are possible. It says he goes, they go after other gods. Amos 5 even says they go after star gods, which is, you know, very possible that the, uh, you know, the secular leaning uh, Israeli government and their scientists might just say, oh, we don't care about the Bible. We're going to go after the enlightenment of the aliens who are, you know, demons people. And we're going to, you know, go throw in league with them. But what's interesting is that, you know, as Jeremiah 4 says, at the end of time, uh, this northern army invades during a false peace. Hmm, and then uh, somebody marches with this Antichrist army, it says the watchers, who are the fallen angels of the uh, end of time. So that's an interesting statement. So why would they say that? And around that, it says several times that Israel 
follows alien gods. Now, sure, it could just be like, you know, ancient statues, blah, blah, blah. But what if it is aliens, as in aliens? Which, you know, why would they be fooled? You know, if some Muslim came up there and claimed to be the Messiah, you know, hey, Israel would not be fooled. But if some interdimensional being claimed to be, you know, their Messiah, they might follow that or might sign a peace treaty with him. Who knows? But this army, a northern army, over and over it says. It says in Daniel 11, like I said, it says in many, many places, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, um, you know, Zechariah, so many places, the northern army invades and breaks the peace, and Israel has to do something that's a key word. It's called flee. Jesus said, when you see this army, or when you see the Antichrist spoken of by Daniel, which I just told you, that's the Daniel seven-year peace treaty, which is broken in the middle. When you see this breaking of this peace treaty, then flee. And women don't even get your stuff. You need to flee so fast. Now, we know now why they would have to flee so fast, because Muslims would kill even pregnant women. They have. They split open pregnant women. They've sold children. And that's why Hosea thirteen sixteen says, children, you're going to be killed, baby. And, you know, women, you're going to be split open. And this is why Jesus said, amazingly, in Matthew 24, Woe to you who are pregnant, and, and, and pray that your flight not be in winter. So that sounds like a big deal. And indeed, all throughout the Old Testament, there's the same sequence of events. And the big key word is flee. It says Israel's invaded during a false peace from the north, and flee, Israel escaped to the mountains, Ezekiel 7 says. And it says that in so many places, flee. And that's a big keyword. So look for that when you're studying the Bible. So again, the, they flee for how long? Three and a half years. It says that in Revelation 12. It says basically that the woman, Israel, gives birth to a son, Jesus. He's caught up to God's throne where he'll rule the nations with a fist, a rod of iron, which is Jesus. It's not the church people. And then in that same chapter, it talks about uh, verse 17, how the Antichrist will then go after the Christians. Thus proving that the people who say that the child is Jesus who's caught up to God's throne or the rapture of the church, that's so sad. It can't be. The whole essence of Revelation 12 is that Israel will give birth to a son, Jesus, who will be resurrected and rule the nations with a rod of iron. And then the devil, when he sees he cannot get to Israel because she's fleed possibly to America by two wings of a great eagle, verse 14, then he gets really mad. And he goes after the testimony of those who give testimony to Jesus Christ, or he goes after the church, which is pretty much the same message throughout the entire Re book of Revelation, that he goes after the church. You know, we overcome him by the word of our testimony and the blood of the Lamb, because the Antichrist goes after the church. In Revelation 11, 2, pay attention, people. The Gentiles will trample Jerusalem for three and a half years. And get this. Luke 21, which all these pointy-headed experts say happened 2,000 years ago, it says that the Gentiles will trample Jerusalem uh, for, well, I'm sorry, they'll trample Jerusalem until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled, which hasn't happened in AD 70, like all the experts says. And then it says, for this is a time of wrath and punishment against the people of Israel. Hmm. And that's a, a big theme out throughout the entire Bible is that God is going to bring this Antichrist, who I believe in Ezekiel 38 is Gog. It says it there. It says, I will turn you around. I will put hooks in your jaws. I will bring you into Israel as, you know, again, as a punishment against Israel. So God brings the Antichrist. I bet you didn't know that. As, as Isaiah 10 says the same thing. I am calling you, the Assyrian dude, the Antichrist, to come in to punish my people. But don't gloat too much, basically, because after I use you to punish my people, then I'm going to turn my wrath upon you, baby. That's what the Bible says, Alan Brooks' translation. And it says that in many, many places that God is angry at his people. If you read Isaiah, the secret pattern happens like 30 to 40 times. God's mad at his people, Isaiah 1. Isaiah 2, uh, God comes back and the kingdom of God is established where there'll be no weapon, you know, that uh, plowshares will beat into pudding hooks and all that stuff. You know, you've heard that famous verse. Then Isaiah 5, uh, 3 through 5, it's repeated again. And Isaiah 5 talks about at the end of that process, um, Jesus comes back as a banner. He whistles for the church to come to him and meet him in the air. 
And over and over that same thing is repeated. I, and then Isaiah 7 through 11 repeats the story. Isaiah 7, uh, the virgin gives birth to Jesus, but then it says at the end, at the end of time, Jesus, I'm going to call for the Assyrian to come against your land. Then Isaiah 8 talks about the world being in darkness at the end of Isaiah 8, and the people looking up and shaking their fists, getting really mad at who? At Jesus, because he comes back in darkness, because the sun, moon, and stars are darkened. Then Isaiah 9 re continues the story. As the world is in darkness, a great light appears. And it's Jesus, unto us a child is born. And then Armageddon is mentioned where boots are burned in battle. And then Isaiah 10 and 11 speak of the millennium. Okay, so it's the same story over and over again. So again, and he also judges people in many of those sequences. So this is a new discovery that I feel I've made. If somebody else has seen it, well, God bless them. Uh, th that Isaiah repeats this same sequence of events uh, 30 times now here's an amazing thing you've never heard before i'm sure of it because god showed me this and i think it's a stunning new find uh, isaiah 15 through uh, 22 is also the sequence of events which is we know from uh, isaiah uh, i'm sorry daniel 11 of 29 through 45 and all of daniel 11 in fact is the battle of the kings of the north versus the kings of the south and at the end of this chapter we're told that this is the antichrist who invades the king of the south. But then he decides to come back up and invade Israel and start the last three and a half years. That's the Antichrist attacking. He's the king of the north throughout the entire Bible. We see this many, many, many times. And so, just, and that matches Daniel 11, which a pe favorite pet saying of mine is that the same God uses the same words and phrases to describe the same events in the same Bible. Now, that doesn't that make sense? So Daniel 11 describes a northern antichrist, Shia, coming down and invading the Sunni and uh, nations of Iraq, Saudi Arabia, and other ones from North Africa, Egypt, and all that. So isn't that amazing? That's exactly what Iran wants to do today. I told this to some famous person from a famous ministry, and he goes, Oh, Alan, you're so stupid. You know, you can never ever, it's, rule, it's a rule here that you can never say current events are part of bible prophecy boy what a dummy you are you know yeah i guess you're right and that's and i donald trump of all people also said that uh uh iran wants to invade saudi arabia they hate them and so their idea we've seen isis trying to make a caliphate but the shias want to make a caliphate too so they're going to come down and sweep down through the middle east i call it the shia street sweep and then they're going to come back up and invade israel and ezekiel 38 says the same thing these nations sweep down and then it says in another verse, they ascend, Gog, the Antichrist, ascends back up to Israel. And so you see how they match Ezekiel 30, I mean, Daniel 11, they sweep down and take over Saudi Arabia, and then they go back. Now, I'm going to tell you an amazing story I know you've never heard before. Isaiah 15 and 16 talk about the Antichrist sweeping through Jordan, I believe. And then the, all, all the way up to Isaiah 21, it talks about all these nations that the Antichrist is going to sweep through and the last nation on his stop his march of terror will be thing saudi arabia who is i believe is the whore of babylon and then the next nation he invades is back up ding israel so you can see here we have an isaiah daniel uh, 11 and ezekiel 38 it's the same story a northern aggressor sweeps down takes over the lower sunni states even North Africa, and then he comes back up, and there he decides at the last minute to invade Israel. Now, doesn't that make a lot more sense? If Let's say if Ezekiel 38 is the Antichrist, and he was sweeping down towards Israel, Israel would not be a peaceful and unsuspecting people, right? But if they're sweeping down in an inter-Muslim war between Sunnis and Shias, and then he comes back up and he decides, oh, at the last moment I'm going to invade Israel, then yes, it would be, Israel would be in peace and would not be expecting. And that even it even alludes to that in Ezekiel 21. It says the Antichrist, the king of Babylon, and all throughout Ezekiel, he's going to come in and invade Israel. After he shakes the dice, he looks at the feathers, he consults the spirits. Now, just a little quick note, Ezekiel 38, I mean, Ezekiel talks about this Antichrist as the king of Babylon. He even invades Babylon as the king of Babylon. That's a little clue 
But anyway, that's just my discovery. In Isaiah, he's called the Assyrian. In Daniel, he's called the king of the north. In Ezekiel, he's called Gog. You know, it's the same name of the same actions by the same people. So, and then the thing, the interpretive method that I've discovered is that the Bible looks like when all this happens, it just happens. Israel is invaded and then Jesus Christ comes back and destroy him. But we know because we're a little smart that there's 15, 16 places that talk about this Antichrist ruling in Jerusalem for three and a half years. And then after he rules, then Jesus Christ comes back. So the proper way to interpret Ezekiel 38 and 39 is the Antichrist invades a peaceful and unsuspecting Israel from the north. Then he rules for three and a half years. And then he comes back at Armageddon, which the end of 30, Ezekiel 39 is 100% Armageddon because it has word for word matches with uh, Revelation 19 about the birds eating the horses and the horses and the mighty men falling, you know, and the great earthquake and many other. There's about five parallels between Ezekiel 39 and uh, Revelation 19, which is definitely Armageddon. So that's why all these years the experts have been figuring out with their microscopes and their uh, puzzle pieces, why doesn't Ezekiel 8 doesn't fit? We don't get it. And so what they didn't realize that you had in that add in that three and a half years. That's why we've all been taught growing up that Ezekiel 38 has to happen now. And then there has to be another piece. And then another Antichrist has to invade Israel. Does that make sense? No, I don't. So anyway, just to finish off this whole little teaching here, the same God uses the same words and phrases and the same Bible describe the same events. And it's always the same, even if they didn't really know about or add in that last three and a half years. Because we know 100% fact, it's written in stone that the Antichrist will rule for three and a half years. Revelation 13, the Antichrist rules for three and a half years. Re uh, Revelation 11:2, the Gentiles trampled Jerusalem for three and a half years. Uh, Revelation 12, Israel flees for three and a half years and with the help of the wings of an eagle. Now, that sounds like America to me, okay? And then Daniel talks about the last three and a half years too. In Daniel 12, it says, the, he asked the angel, well, when is the kingdom of God going to come to earth? And he goes, it's going to be about 1290 days or a, a little over three and a half years from the abomination which is, again, Jesus also talked about the last three and a half years. He goes, when you see this abomination or the Antichrist invading Israel and coming into the temple and proclaiming himself, God. after the Antichrist does all that, then he's going to trample Jerusalem for three and a half years. And doesn't it make sense that Muslims would want to do that? They hate Israel. They want to drive her into the sea and they're going to rule the known Muslim world for three and a half years. That time is mentioned, I think, 15 times. So that's the sequence of events that's written in stone, like Pearl Harbor through uh, Hiroshima. The Bible set in stone about the end of time is a false peace. A northern army invades and breaks that peace. Israel flees. Then this Antichrist will trample Jerusalem for three and a half years, as Revelation 11.2 says. And then what happens next? After the tribulation, Jesus Christ, then Jesus Christ will come back as the banner. He'll, the sun, moon, and stars will be darkened. And he'll come back and judge everyone. He'll do Armageddon. And then he will set up the millennium. And like I said, in Isaiah, that's, that same thing is written over and over again. And oh yeah, in Isaiah 21, after he uh, invades Saudi Arabia, then he'll sweep back up and invade Israel when they're peaceful and unsuspecting. And now you know why. They won't be expecting an invasion because they'll think it's just an inter-Muslim war. Okay, people? So I hope you've learned something today. Again, I'm not saying I'm that smart. I'm not. But sometimes it takes someone out of the box to see something that the experts don't, can't see. Why? Because they're looking in their microscopes. They're looking at all the Greek and Arabic and all that stuff, you know. And they just, they're doing what experts do. But sometimes there's a big picture that they miss. And I saw this and I, I can't believe that they missed it. But now you know the secret of the end times. That there's one sequence of events that's repeated almost 100 times throughout the Bible. Now have you heard that? No, you haven't. Anyway, but it's the truth. 
and I stand on the truth. This is Alan Brooks. If you want to email me and ask questions, it's a Brook, no S, eight, the number eight at AWOL.com, uh, and I'll be glad to answer any questions. And please don't beat me up. I'm a nice person. I'm just trying to study the Bible. And again, another, oh, another point. Everybody beats me up about Joel 2.31. It says, the day of the Lord happens, uh, the sun, moon, and stars are darkened before the day of the Lord. Well, the word before there is litany. And it can mean before as in I come before the king, not 20 minutes before. So if there's 40 places that say the day of the Lord happens when people say peace, and it's an invasion of Israel, and uh by the antichrist and there's this one place that it could say that the day the sun moon and stars are darkened before the day of the lord i don't buy it i think it means before as in you know before the stars or before all the you know all the principalities and everything but anyway that's what i believe i go the 40 places that prove my point that israel's invaded on the day of the lord during peace and the worst of the gentiles comes in and he beats up israel and he sets up the abomination which amazingly, there's a cool verse in Ezekiel 7. It talks about on the day, the worst of the Gentiles invades Israel. He breaks the peace. Israel flees to the mountains. And then this Antichrist, the bad dude, the worst of the Gentiles, it defiles the temple. Then Ezekiel 7, uh, the next chapter, Ezekiel 8, says that a statue, an idol of jealousy, is placed in the entrance to the temple. And then the word abomination is used next. Now, isn't that stunning? Isn't that crazy? And then Ezekiel 10 and 11 talks about Jesus Christ coming back and standing on a mountain east of Jerusalem, which is exactly what Zechariah 14, 4 says, that Jesus Christ will come back and stand on a mountain east of Jerusalem. So that's what I'm saying, people. All the experts will say, Ezekiel 7, oh, <laughs> it happened in the past. But now you know it's part of the future prophecies about Jesus Christ coming back and standing on a mountain. Thank you very much. This is Alan Brooks.